you through a session that's focused more on the business side of hypercasual, right? There's a lot of amazing content around and a panel straight after this that I'm joining on, you know, more like the design and trend side of hypercasual. But I think it's really important that um, for all you great entrepreneurs out there and studio CEOs or people that want to open a studio that you really understand the business side of hypercasual. So that's what my talk is going to focus on, right? How do you negotiate and how should you negotiate a hyper casual publishing deal um, and also um, whilst I'm not giving any legal advice today I'm going to walk you through some of the key sort of terms and components of a hyper casual contract as well to help you understand what they mean so my goal is I, I'm really passionate about arming with deve arming developers with as much information um, as possible on the business side of hyper casual so they can make the best decisions um, for their studio so let's uh, let's dive in Switch in here, right. So really, really briefly about Boombit, for those of you that, that don't know us, we've been in mobile games since 2014. And first and foremost, we're a developer, right? Uh, been developing games for a long time, um, been working with publishers. So back in the day, we're working with Cheetah Mobile, who published Dancing Line for us. Um, and then uh, we moved more into sort of RPG, mid-core games. Hopefully some of you have played like Tiny Gladiators, Tanks a lot. Um, our two awesome CEOs took us to an IPO in 2019. Um, and as of Q4 last year, we've kind of come back to our free to play routes and specifically uh, hyper casual games. Um, and it's been an incredible ride uh, this year. The team have done and all of our partners have done amazing work, built some incredible games. Um, that's 164 million downloads this year, of which 115 are just from our hyper casual games. Um, so it's a really exciting time at Boombit. Um, and also, I'm going to touch on this a little bit later, but uh, this is our latest game. Um, it's uh, been top 10 iOS, US and Android. Uh, and the reason we're really proud of it is you probably won't associate it with uh, Boombit. It's actually through a studio that we've invested in, uh, Tap Nice, uh, something I'll mention a little bit later. So let, let's dive in because um, this session is really about uh, all of you developers and uh, how to help you make better commercial decisions. So wh where should you start with a publishing deal? So most developers start here, right? It's how much can I get for a prototype? And if that's your first question, then it's the wrong question, right? You need to start with you and your team, right? It sounds obvious, um, but it's actually where you need to start with, right? It's not about starting with the money. It's about understanding your, your team, the gaps in your knowledge, the things that you really need to learn. Um, and of course, I'm not saying the financials aren't important because, you know, we all have, um, you know, license fees to pay, team to pay, need to put food on the table. Um, but for me, that is very much secondary and relying on really where you want to go for a studio, what your what your ambition is. So once you figure that out, look at your team, look at the skills you have and look at the skills that you don't have, because the skills that you don't have, I'm not saying you should go and hire people, but that's really the role of a publisher, right? The, the foremost role of a publisher is to invest in you, teach you, help you learn and understand hyper casual games, right? And obviously the money is an important part of that, right? Because it uh, enables you to pay your team and survive, but it's the, the first piece that is most important. So really analyze your, your team and understand where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are. And also do your homework on hyper casual games. You know, hyper casual games are so big now that I kind of think of it like casual games. You've got actually specific categories of hyper casual games that are actually very different in the way that you build them, in the way that you monetize them. Um, and I know some studios want to attack everything, but there are some studios that have got, you know, particular skills or coders or scripts or artists that are really good at specific genres. So have a think about really the genres that also are a best fit for you in terms of your ability and that you want to build. And then actually have a look at the, the publishers that are very strong in those specific categories. Because as you start looking there, you know, there are some publishers that specialize in certain genres and not others. So make sure you look at those as well. Um, another really important thing about you is to really have your own game thesis and identity. So what I mean about that is, well, how do you want to develop games, right? Because of course, when you talk to a publisher, like they should be proactive and give you, you know, GDDs and ideas. But 
you also want to have your own view on really how you want to attack that. So I often think about three pillars of, of game development from the studio perspective. Um, you know, there's no doubt that uh, if you analyze a lot of games in the charts, they're not necessarily new games, right? They are improved versions of games that we've seen in the charts three months ago, six months ago, two years ago. Um, so you should always look at games and see, you know, where you can put your own twist on them, right? I absolutely don't clone them, copy them, but have a look at, you know, ways that you can improve existing games. Um, right now, there's a really exciting trend around blending different game mechanics. It's really exciting, you know, draw and run, uh, draw and fight, for example, uh, and then your wild cards. And this is what I love about hyper casual, right? Um, you should always be challenging yourself and your team just to come up with those ideas that no matter how crazy they are, don't rule them out, just test them, look at the data. And, uh, you know, it's it's also you need those wild cubs to keep your team's energy going, right? Because at times, hyper casual, we all know it's quite grueling going through, you know, certain themes or ideas that, you know, maybe a publisher is pushing you down a certain direction, but you don't want to do it, but you need to do it to get your prototype money. Um, so it's also important to have those just sort of random ideas that you you free your team to work on as well. So let's, with that in mind, let's dive into the main commercial elements of a, of a publishing deal. So this is probably your first question that you, you may want to start thinking about, you know, to be exclusive with a publisher or, or not to be exclusive. Now, for me, as a really good friend of mine, and what he said has always stuck with me, he's like, well, look, John, if, I, if a publisher wants me to be exclusive with them, that's absolutely fine, but they've got to pay for it. And what he meant by that is, is really simple, because... Obviously, if you're not exclusive, you have the freedom to work with different publishers and each different publisher has got different commercial terms, right? You maybe have two different teams, maybe you have three different teams, and maybe the route you've decided is to match up each team with a different publisher on different commercial terms. So at a minimum, if you're going to work exclusively with a publisher, the amount of money being offered, however, it's in what format it's being offered, should make up for the total of all your other publisher deals. Um, and obviously, outside of the money, um, well, what is the the massive upside of of locking into one specific publisher? Is it is it tools? Is it specific team members? Is it some sort of geographical advantage? So this is a big question that you you, you need to think about. Um, also, you need to think about the length of exclusivity. So you, again, going back to this being all about you and the journey you're on, where are you at on that journey? You know, what's your priority? Is it just to learn everything you can about hyper casual? You know, have you already had your first hit and you're going into that exciting next phase, phase of growth? So maybe you may not want such a long period of exclusive, uh, exclusivity because you might be thinking about self-publishing that will come on to late, uh, later. And, and clearly one challenge of non-exclusive is working with different publishers is great. You learn a lot, but of course they've got different processes, different ways of testing, different schools of thought, different game development processes. Um, so an advantage of working with one sometimes is at least you can train your team and way of thinking around a specific publisher. Um, so let's look at the different commercial models we've got here. So the first one is paper prototype. So really simply, this is you deliver a prototype to a publisher. Now, usually it's not as simple as you just don't, you, know, you just send them any random idea and they pay you for it. For me, that's terrible business on behalf of the publisher. Um, really, it should be a joint conversation, a discussion either around your idea or their idea. You go away and you deliver a prototype. But what you need to be clear on is, well, what, what exactly are they paying for, right? What is a, what is a prototype? Because everyone uh, defines that differently. Is it, you know, is it a simple build with four levels? Is it 10 minutes of gameplay? So you need to be really clear on what this definition of a prototype is. Um, are there any requirements or metrics that you need to hit before you actually get paid that, right? Or is it as simple as you've agreed on the game design document and once you've delivered the, the defined amount of time or amount of gameplay, then you, you get paid. Um, or actually, you don't get paid until you've hit a CPI of X or a day one of Y. Usually, there's a discussion around how many prototypes you can deliver on a on a monthly basis. And really, that's for you to decide, not the publisher, right? Because if you let the publisher decide that, then they're really running your business and your sprints and your workflows. So you need to decide as a team, really what you're comfortable delivering. And I fully appreciate that that's always a difficult decision because it's that balance between the amount of money you need to cover all your costs 
um, coupled with actually the breathing room and freedom to actually focus and, and make games. Um, and then the other consideration here is, you know, is there like a, a, a step beforehand where you've got to pass through some sort of CTR video requirement? Or with the publisher, you're going to go straight to CPI and you just have to deliver a bill. So some considerations there. RevShare. Um, so you've got your paper prototype model and then you're probably going to have some conversations about RevShare. So this quite simply um, for anyone new to this is where a developer will take a agreed percentage of uh, game profit. Um, always get this question well, what, what's the typical revenue share a developer receives I, I wouldn't really say there is a standard rev share right because you've got some variables in this you've got the slide we just covered which is well how much you get per prototype you've maybe got some other things to consider well what what else non uh, financial is the publisher going to give you that actually has some value so for example are they giving you their ideas that are maybe ctr tested or even cpi tested because in that case the publisher may think, well, that's got an increased value for argument's sake. So there isn't really a typical rev share, but, um, you know, you need to decide what you want to negotiate for and and, and how you're prepared to uh, maneuver. My perspective is always this when I'm asked, right? Um, you need to think about you as a studio because the paper prototype, ultimately, that's some sort of fixed cost, right? And you know, if you deliver two in a month, you're going to get X amount of money. Um, but really the big upside and the big win is going to be in terms of percentage rev share because you might just say okay we'll do 70 30 but if you end up publishing a game and let's say that game makes a million dollars you've just given away 20 percent, right which is you've just given away two hundred thousand dollars so i'm not saying um every time go in and, and and negotiate 50 50 rev share you know for me personally i think unless there is a huge imbalance in terms of the publisher is is providing something incredible i think 50 50 rev share is very fair right i think that that says one thing which is a partnership so um have a think about that uh, be very clear on the definition of of rev share as well right um and we're going to come on to the contract a bit later for me the simple definition of of rev share is the total amount of money a game makes minus the UA cost um, or the UA money that the publisher has spent on that game and some small third party costs like um, any app store fees or attribution fees or, or anything like that. Um, but we're going to come on to this point later because it's really important that you have some clarity on how the publisher runs their business in terms of how much of your game profits are being reinvested into UA. Um, and then final point on rev share, always ask and be clear on any exclusion or triggers for the rev share to start. So obvious question, do you get rev share on iOS and Android worldwide? Or actually, do you only get rev share on iOS and Android in these four countries? So be really clear on this. Don't make any assumptions. So an alternative model um, to the paper prototype and the, the rev share is, is a bonus payment model that um, some publishers offer. So this is usually a blend of sort of bonus payments as you move through the different stages of the publishing process. So the model may look something like I've illustrated below for you. So you may get an initial amount of money at the prototype stage. Then when the game is published, and again, be clear on this definition of published, each uh, publisher will have a different perspective on what that means. You may get another amount of money. And then sometimes you might hear the word like a confirmation period. So just because a game is published doesn't mean you're going to be uh, a millionaire, right? All it means is, OK, we've published the game. We're in soft launch and we're going to see if we can now scale this over a period of time. And that's the confirmation period. And if over that confirmation period, the game meets the publisher's ROAS or ARPU goals, then that's when they really start investing UA and trying to scale your game. And then you'll get some more money. And then usually there are bonus payments per X million of installs, but again, check that those bonus payments, um, check which countries they're for. Don't just assume it's for worldwide or all, all geos. So um, th those, are your, those are your different models um, that you can look at. So what are your other commercial options? You know, are there any other models? So you've got your paper prototype model. Um, some developers ask for a minimum guarantee, right? So a minimum guarantee is some sort of upfront payment of X amount of money to be negotiated, usually paid when the game is published. And usually this payment is recoupable. So what that means is it's not free money. 
um, it means that that money is paid on publishing. But when you uh, look at the royalties and profit that a game has made, the publisher can take that amount of money out of the game profits. Okay, so some people I've heard people say, "Oh, it's free money." It's not free money. It's a minimum guarantee that is usually rec recoupable from game profits. Um, there's sometimes this work for hire model. So I know some studios, if you're cutting your teeth, um, some publishers are always looking for studios just to build some very quick CTR videos or a really basic build for them to, to validate ideas and they'll pay you for that. Just understand that it probably won't be you making that game if it's got uh, a, a, you know good metrics, they will be giving it to one of their tier one studios, but it's a good commercial approach to consider if you're just trying to build your team and want to get some cash flow in. Uh, another attractive option is fixed monthly payments. So rather than the paper prototype model, you can negotiate a fixed amount of money every month that a publisher pays you in return for certain deliverables. So whether it's CTR tests or CPI. Now, the advantage of this for you is that you can actually manage cash flow in your business because, you know, every month you have, you know, five thousand, ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars coming in that enables you to sustain and maintain a team. Um, again, caveat here is that it depends on the length of your contract and the cancellation clauses, um, but that is the upside of that model. The final one, um, again, if you've got a great relationship with the publisher and usually if you've published a game, um, there's a lot of M&A activity happening right now in mobile games and, and around hyper casual. So there are uh, some publishers, uh, including Boombit, that also have a M&A uh, attitude towards hyper casual where we invest or there's some other exciting collaboration opportunities that you should explore that will really help you to accelerate your business so that's a that's a walkthrough of the sort of different sort of commercial options you'll have when you think about structuring a deal with a publisher and you know i'll leave you to decide what sounds most interesting for you and your team now the other important thing to look at is, of course, the hyper casual contracts, right? And I'm going to say the same thing about NDAs as well. Don't just sign a piece of paper because you think it's the same as something you've seen before. Um, signing an NDA is as important as signing a contract. You need to read it and you need to look at the clauses of an NDA. It is not just uh, you, you only read the contract. So let's have a look at some contract clauses and I'll break it down into sections for you. So there's going to be some. Um, what's happened there sorry about that it's just gone out of presentation mode let's jump back in the joys of presenting live from the other side of the world right let's skip back through to here we go so let's look at some um game related contract terms so this is the big one right who owns the ip of the game so for you as a developer you want to run to the hills if you see a contract that is asking for exclusive exclusive ownership of a game right you should only agree to that if they're going to pay you a lot of money right and usually these are clauses you find maybe in other game genres not in hyper casual right what you should be looking to agree to is an exclusive license to the publisher for this specific uh, of, of your ip for this specific game that that's it no more than that um what else is going to be in their game related? So this is an important one. So what, what if a publisher rejects your game, right? You submit it, you do the CPI test, the day one test, and they reject it. Are you then free to take that to another publisher, right? Um, that's something that you need to decide if that's something you want to do. And that's something you should, if you do, make sure you negotiate. Um, the next one is how are certain terms defined in, in terms of relation to a game? So, for example, I mentioned earlier, well, well, actually, what is a prototype? Don't just assume because you work with one publisher and they define it this way, that it's going to be the same in your next contract. So be really clear on the definitions of certain um, game related clauses. And again, sometimes linked to the IP question, you may see clauses that are linked to the right of first refusal on like any games from your studio. Um, or like a sequel to the game. If, um, you know, increasingly now in hyper casual, we're seeing some really cool like action games and you can totally see how there's going to be a sequel to that game. So again, make sure that you really look at all these game related clauses. So also in a contract, you've got clauses specific to, to time frame. So the obvious one is going to be what is the length of the contract, right? Is it paper prototype with a three month expiration? 
is it a three month contract? If it's a three month contract, what happens after three months? Is there a clause in there that um, has got any performance related metrics, for example, that if you don't hit those then the publisher can cancel? So again, don't just get really excited that you've got a contract, look at the length of the contract. Um, well, what happens if you submit a game to a publisher and the publisher doesn't do anything with it, okay? Again, you're trying to plan for things that you don't want to happen, but if they do happen, you have, you're legally covered for it. Um, so you wanna see if there's any legal wording around that that covers you for that. Um, again, hyper casual is all about speed, right? And you know that as soon as you've got a game in the app store, you're always hearing stories that literally a day later, you see someone else with the same game in there. So how long is this approval process for game tests and approving prototypes, right? Um, how long is it going to take the publisher to do a CPI test? If it's taken them two weeks, um, alarm bell should go off. So there should be some discussion up front. And these kind of things generally should be on a confluence page or some sort of documentation the publisher sends you before you even sign. Um, but I'd make sure there is, you know, again, you need to make sure this stuff is covering you, not just the publisher in the contract, because if they're not performing, then you need to have legal clauses to enable you to get out pretty easily. Um, cancellation clause. Uh, again, you need to have a look at this one. My usual rule is that it should be mutual, right? As I said earlier, you know, rev share 50-50. It's, it's, a, it's a partnership, right? You want a partner. Um, so it's only fair that a cancellation clause should be mutual, right? So if the publisher is able to cancel for reason X, Y, and Z, well, so should you. Um, pretty rare these days and very hard to enforce, but make sure there is an uh, infinite agreement clause, i.e. the contract just goes forever and you can't get out. Uh, and renewal clause, as I sort of mentioned uh, uh, earlier. Well, what are what are the terms for renewal? So if it's a six month clause, um, you know, is there a 30 day notice period that the publisher has to give you to uh, to cancel like one month before? Um, what happens six months to one day in? Does it just automatically renew, roll over? So make sure that's clear. Uh, bonus payments. Uh, again, um, it, it's great to get these agreed, but you now need to actually look at how this is worded in the contract. So I've covered probably the key one earlier, which is um, making sure that these apply to both iOS and Android. Um, and, and the biggie is making sure that if there are any geographies excluded, you're super clear on that up front and it's written in the contract. And again, uh, it's up to you to negotiate that. Everything is, is negotiable. Um, what KPIs need to be hit? Um, so make sure that that's clearly agreed and discussed and in uh, in the contract. Um, and you know there aren't any just of these sort of clauses. You know, please refer to the T's and C's or some hidden clause in the contract. It should just be written down if there are any uh, KPIs you need to hit. What those trigger payments are. Um, I said earlier, what does what does break even mean? Does break even mean that um, the game has made literally one cent? is break even the publisher has recouped your uh, your minimum guarantee is it that they've recouped your uh, your retainer fee that is linked to developing this game and once that's all recouped then you're at zero dollars and the rev share actually starts um the confirmation period as i said if it's in there in the bonus model well how long is it like if so how long is it um and are there any specific requirements that you might want to think about e.g Okay, so in this confirmation period, I've I've cleared the, the tests you need me to do on Facebook, and then all of a sudden this second ad network comes along that you didn't know about, and you've now got to hit some more KPIs, and you've not hit them, and your game is killed. So make sure all of these are discussed up front and written in the contract. Um, other contract clauses that you probably want to look out for. So um, as I said, th this is the key one goes back to IP. Um, so it's all about you're granting a license that a publisher can purely use your game uh, IP um, purely for this game, right? Um, not that you're basically giving them your game and they can use it for, you know, lots of other games um, and they maybe can do some other things with your IP that aren't okay with you. Um, the next one, again, it sounds odd, but I've seen them uh, making sure that, that really any clause that enables a publisher to have right of first refusal on any of your games or again, I know some studios are uh, growing really quickly now and they've set up another studio or a different team. Well, check your contract because there could be a clause in it that you've got this other team working with another publisher, but this publisher's contract says you can't do that, that they have first right of refusal for 
any game your studio makes or any game your studio has a majority interest in another studio or another team. So you want to check that. Um, there's always going to be tax withholding tax clauses. So make sure this is clearly covered and that you you really understand. So this is also not just legal advice, but make sure you get tax advice because there are different tax laws around the world and you don't want any uh, nasty surprises or you've calculated your business model based on certain numbers and you've not uh, taken into account withholding tax. Um, what genres of games does the contract cover, right? Does it specifically say hyper casual? If it does say hyper casual, well, how does it define hyper casual? Um, because obviously, you know, hyper casual is grown as a category. It's getting very close to um, things like hyper idle now, um, you know, hybrid casual. So you don't want a contract that you think um, is a great contract, but actually it restricts you from working with another publisher for idle games for argument's sake. Um, and then uh, kind of linked to my earlier point about confirmation periods, etc. You need to look at and, and see if there's any clauses that relate to who's responsible for what part of the development and the publishing process. So what, what I mean by that is it sounds fairly obvious, but, you know, it needs to be written down whose responsibilities are what. So if there are any, you know, issues or you, you know, for any reason you do want to leave your publisher, you have legal grounds to because you can clearly point in the contract that, um, you know, when it comes to game design or level design or um, implementing an SDK, that that is something that they are supposed to pro provide support for and it's written in the contract. Uh, just a quick word on SDKs. Usually there should be a specific clause in the contract relating to onboarding a publisher's SDK because there's various, um, you know, like privacy clauses and some other compliancy clauses around that. Um, so make sure that's in there as well. Uh, contract jargon. Uh, again, uh, you know, a, a lot of you are very talented game developers. You didn't study um, law at uh, university, at college, at night school. Um, so it's really important that you get uh, a lawyer to look at your contract and don't make any assumptions. But here are some of the main uh, main terms. As I said earlier about minimum guarantees, recoupable quite simply means that a publisher can recover that cost, whatever recoupable is next to. Versus non-recoupable, uh, a publisher cannot cover that uh, recoup that cost from uh, game profit. So if you have a non-recoupable minimum guarantee, um, think of that boat that minimum guarantee as effectively a, a bonus. It it won't be recovered from game profit. Minimum guarantee again, we covered that earlier. That's a minimum amount of money a publisher will pay you. But look at what the clauses are against that exclusivity period. So um, fairly self-explanatory, but that basically means a, a period of time that you can only exclusively work for uh, for a pub certain publisher. Um, a material obligation and a material breach. It sounds very serious, but effectively what that means is a material obligation is uh, a fundamental obligation that you as a developer or the publisher, something that you have to do as part of the contract, e.g. you have to deliver a certain number of prototypes and therefore, a material breach of a contract might be that you've not delivered a pre-agreed number of prototypes that meet a certain set of KPIs. And that could be defined as a material breach, which enables a publisher to terminate your contract. Um, you know, the intellectual property, as I've covered, uh, I put it here again because it's such an important clause. But really, the word that you're looking for around IP is the granting of an exclusive license of your game, your IP to a publisher. Um, the next section is really linked to where I started, which is it being about you. So you, we've gone through, you know, the how you might want to structure a contract. We've gone through some terms. I've also put some together some questions that I hope will be useful to help you find uh, the right publishing partner. Or perhaps actually going through these questions, you realize that the right route for you is not working with a publisher. The right route for you is, is self-publishing. So let's go through some of these. As, a, as I said, a, a publishing relationship is a partnership. It's not just a financial one. Um, and you need to learn something, right? No matter where you are on your journey, hyper casual is always changing. There are different trends. Um, you need to keep up with uh, those trends and always be learning. So the first question is, you know, a publishing manager, right? A, a publishing manager for me is not an account manager, right? A publishing manager is not someone that simply just sets up CTR tests, um, and gives you results, right? A publishing manager should be someone that can actually add some initial value to 
ideas that you're sending over and be able to talk to you a little bit about they shouldn't necessarily be you know i'm not saying they should be a game designer but they should be able to really add some initial value versus just being a coordinator that every time you send a game over there's really nothing to add and all they're doing is adding an extra layer to the process so when you're going to work with a publisher ask them okay well who who am i going to be working with and, and what's their background what's their experience if they've got experience in game design that's great Another key question is, well, how many studios is the publishing manager I'm going to be working with looking after, right? Because um, the simple reality of hyper casual and the way that the publishing business has been built is it's a volume game, right? The way you build your business is, right, I want to publish X number of games a month, so let's work backwards. So therefore, I'm going to need X number of games in, let's say, day seven in my publishing funnel, X number at day one, and therefore, I need to test X amount. So really you would have done the maths on how many studios and games you need to test to get those many games a quarter um so i'm telling you that to give you some more context on this point which is if you really want to learn my question would be well if a publishing manager is looking after 15 studios and each of those studios is, is building two games a month that one publishing manager is looking after 30 games a month how much time and energy and effort are you going to get from that specific publishing manager? So think about um, that question. The next one, again, is, is super important. So you want to ask the publisher and also you need to ask yourself what's, what's more important, right? Is it chart position, revenue or profit? OK, now revenue, game revenue and profit are not the same thing. And this comes back to a subtle point I mentioned earlier that we'll dive into now about um, being clear on a publisher's business model, okay? Anyone, if you've got the UA funding, can be top of the charts, right? It's just a question of bidding very aggressively. You don't care about LTV, um, you don't care about ARPU. It's just bidding really, really aggressively, outbidding you know, other people that are bidding for the same users as you, and you'll get a certain chart position, right? Um, and if you are a publisher, one of the benefits of being top of the charts is, of course, it's free advertising. As a developer, you know, what's one of the sources that you look at for a publisher you want to work with? You, you look at the top of the charts, right? Because um, that's where top games are. But what you won't see behind the scenes and what you won't know is just because a game is in the top 10, top 20, it doesn't necessarily make, mean that there's a direct correlation to how profitable that game is, right? So have this discussion with the with the publisher, you know, what kind of um, like ARPU goals, ROAS goals that they typically have um, versus profit. Well, that's really simple. You know, I always joke with uh, developers. It's kind of like, right, would you like that plaque on your wall that says, hey, I had a number one game or would you like to buy everyone in your studio a Ferrari? Right. That's uh, you know the, the decision that perhaps you made me want to think about. What's more important, like a vanity being top of the charts or a game that is highly profitable? So this is the key, key thing to dig into, because what you need to be confident is that the publisher isn't going to be basically reinvesting your game profit um, for their own benefit to boost the game in the charts. Um, again, you want to understand that a publisher's got your corner. So where does that publisher stand on copying versus cloning games? And if a publisher sees someone has cloned your game, uh, how do they respond to that, right? Are they going to have your uh, studio's corner? Are they going to send a cease and desist letter? Um, you know, it's it's a very sort of hot and debated topic in hyper casual, but make sure you ask that. We cover this in the contract, but, it, but it's really key. This isn't just at the... Um, sign contract stays even when you test the game under NDA right just be really clear that well if you as a publisher reject my game because it doesn't meet your requirements can I test that with someone else now my view is well absolutely if your game doesn't meet that publisher's requirements why does why should why do they have the right to stop you testing that with another publisher because as I said at the start every publisher's got a slightly different business model a slightly different skill set different metrics so that's a very important question to ask. You know, an, an obvious one, it doesn't matter about the top charts, but there needs to be a certain proven track record of scaling games in the charts, right? So at least it gives you some confidence that they have a UA and monetization team that have the ability to balance um, the important levers in hyper casual games. Um, 
what extra resource can they provide you as a studio with? So at the start, I said to look at your team, like where are you strong, where are you not strong? Maybe you're very talented at ideas and you're great at coding, but um, you know you need some extra uh, sort of 3D art support or maybe some UI UX support. So have a discussion as part of your partnership. Well, you know, if you've got a game that tests really well, make sure that that publisher can, uh, you know, assign you, you know, one, two people to really help you make that game as, as good as it can be. Um, what's your approach to building creatives? So some studios like to build their own creatives. Others just don't necessarily know how to or have the resource. So make sure you're really clear whose role it is to build creatives. And also have a conversation around uh, the approach to testing uh, CTR. Don't just assume that the way a publisher tests your game is the same, right? Um, do they test on iOS versus Android? If they test on Facebook, well, where do they test on Facebook? Do they test on Facebook feed? Do they test on Instagram? Do they test on fan? Do they test on all three? So make sure you understand because... This is uh, you know, a common question we get a lot. Well, I tested this game with a publisher and I had these results. Well, do you know how and where they tested? On, oh, it was just on Facebook, but where on Facebook? Oh, they didn't tell me. So make sure you understand where your publisher is testing um, and make sure they give you that information as well, right? There's no reason why a publisher shouldn't be able to break down the creative results, the, you know, the CTR results, the CPC results by each creative that has been tested um, and also, if they are running on Facebook, Instagram fan, they can break down um, the results uh, for each of those channels. There's no reason why they couldn't and shouldn't do that. And I think it's important for you to know that. So make sure you cover those questions as well. Do you provide creative support? So obviously, a key part of this is around, you know, certainly when you get to CPI, you're trying to find the lowest uh, CTR possible, the lowest CPI. So it's really important that a publisher can provide you with creative support. And then when you get to the publishing stage, again, um, there's loads of great tools out there like Sensor Tower and App Annie and some others where you can also look at and check out like the creative that's running. So, you know, really great trend, particularly when you start looking at influencer marketing and ad networks is to make sure you're building creative specifically for that ad network and also doing some really clever things like blending in um, like some hot memes from social media or some uh, real life game, uh, real life content as well to be mixed with the gameplay. So check out their creative skills. Uh, how are they going to communicate with you? Um, you know, look, I'm a big fan of automation and dashboards, but there's no substitute for human beings and actual getting real feedback on your game rather than just, oh, your CTR was 2% and your CPC was 30%. What other ideas have you got, right? Because how are you going to learn? So ideally, you would want a dedicated Slack channel, not just with a publishing manager, but with some other team members in there that have got different skill sets that are going to be important, uh, particularly as you go through the process and start looking at uh, retention, uh, you know, day seven, you're going to want a game designer, you're going to want a level designer, people that can really dig into data and unblock uh, the user journey for you. Um, do you provide game ideas? Um, you know, take this pressure off your back. Actually, it doesn't matter if you're not the best at ideas. If you're an incredible studio that's got, you know, great coding ability, beautiful art style, you're super fast. That That's, that's absolutely fine. Right? Not everyone is a genius or um, dull into pop culture and come up with these amazing ideas. So if if you're not strong when it comes to ideation, then make sure you're with a publisher that has got pre-approved game design documents that they can brief you in on and you can build their ideas. Um, trend reports, super important. I mean, hypercasual trends literally change by the week. Um, yeah, I've mentioned it a few times. There's a direct correlation between hypercasual content and what's happening on social media on TikTok, in the world around us. So it's really important that your publisher is sharing both trends on mechanics and game themes. Um, and really, to you know, it sounds like an obvious question, but ask your publisher, well, what, what am I going to learn by, you know, what, what am I going to learn by working with you? Am I going to learn about UA monetization? Am I going to learn about game trends? Am I going to learn about UI UX? What am I actually going to learn through working with you? Just a really quick slide as well on, um, I've, I've mentioned sort of KPIs and metrics that some of these clauses are linked to. So just some really obvious ones um, that in case you don't know what they are, go through these really quickly. So video CTR. So video CTR, uh, there's a real split opinion on this in hypercasual, right? In terms of, is there a correlation between 
CTR and CPI, right? And I think there are some publishers, some developers that build certain categories of games that have got a lot of data and they feel very comfortable correlating CTR with CPI. I also know a lot of developers that believe there is no relationship between CTR and CPI. So, you know, we've had a game recently that had um, CTR of three, uh, about 3% and you did the CPI test and it was 11 cents, right? So usually video CTR, how many people are clicking on your video? Uh, and generally, you know, from sort of quick conversations in the space right now, you know, uh, 4% seems to be the average. But bear in mind in Q4, that needs to be higher because CPI's cost of media generally go up around 30%. Um, CPC, so it's not just about CTR. You also need to look at CPC. So general guidance there is anything under 20 cents is interesting. Anything under 10 cents is very interesting. Um, CPI, your cost per install. You know, CTR is great, but there's no substitute for your CPI. But also just be prepared that that CPI is going to change as you go through the process, because there's so many variables in hyper casual, you know, the Facebook algorithm. Uh, you know, you've got you've got Black Friday coming up right now, which has had the US elections. There's so many things going on in this whole process that will impact CPI. So it's not going to stay the same the whole way through uh, and retention. So usually there will be a day one and day seven retention goal that the publisher is looking for. Um, and then the things that aren't publicly talked about but are really, really important all this as well is to understand how these all fit together and what their uh, ARPU ROAS target is as well. It won't be anywhere near a contract, but this is something that I would encourage you to do some reading up on and, and understand because this is really sort of the hidden part in a commercial deal that will really depend how much profit a game makes. Okay, so I think I've probably given you enough to think about. Is there anything else that you should be thinking about? Well, um, a few other basic tips. Always get a lawyer to check a contract. Really simple. Um, and make sure you've got a good accountant to advise you on tax issues as well. Uh, always negotiate. Um, you know, apart from maybe some fundamental things, some tax laws, etc. Um, a lot of these commercial terms and everything I've spoken about should be negotiable. And you know what? If you don't feel comfortable with it, and it's not a partnership walk away, right? It's a, it's a great time to be a developer. There are so many options out there for you in terms of publishers, self-publishing. So just walk away. Always talk to, to several publishers, right? Because you want to get a feel for their process, uh, their contract terms. It's not just about the money, as I keep saying. Um, and then pick the one that you think is going to give you that best balance of sort of learning plus commercial stability uh, and make sure you get all your questions answered in detail right a publisher should be able to share with you their testing process how they see hyper casual um you know where their strengths are you know what things they've learned right because that's the thing about hyper casual you're going to fail more than you win so i think you also want a humble publisher as well because we also get a lot of things wrong um, this is a great slide from uh, Game Analytics. So thank you to the awesome team there. But um, I'm not going to discuss this in a lot of detail, but you may also want to think about self-publishing, right? Working with a publisher has many, many great benefits, as really I've covered in this presentation, resources, learning, UA funding. Um, but there's also a lot of benefits to self-publishing. And I'm seeing a lot of studios now really exploring this model because it gives you really a lot more freedom and control over your game process metrics for example because all of a sudden you're not giving away 30 40 50 60 percent um, of your game revenue to a publisher so if you factor that into your benchmarks well, all of a sudden you don't need a 10 cent cpi you don't need a day one of 50 to actually start making you know 5 10k a day profit so um i would uh, I, I would advise you to look at the best route for the studio, uh, your studio that is based on really where you are right now. And of course, your cash flow. Self-publishing options, so just a touch on this really briefly. Uh, I see a few options here. So, of course, you've got the publisher option. Um, I know some studios now that are doing a hybrid option. So they work with a publisher, but they've now actually got a separate team that are um, self-publishing their games, they're doing their own UA and monetization and trying to teach themselves and, and learn. Um, I also know some studios now that have completely broken free of the publishing model and are self-publishing. So, you know, a kind of a recurring theme here is usually they've worked with the publisher for a while, they've had that breakout hit, so they have some money, they've validated their process, 
and they use that to go out and maybe raise some money for some angels um, or maybe they've had multiple successes and they really want to grow their business and they're looking at the VC option or actually now there's some really interesting businesses like some of the ones I've put on this slide here um, that offer UA funding um, and I'd encourage you to get to know some of them um, of course you need each of these businesses is very different and they can explain better than I can about which geographies they can and can't lend money to but um, really why I'm telling you this is because the world of hyper casual is changing very fast in favor of the developer and there are a lot more options open to you than there was before so I hope that was helpful for you I've covered a lot of ground um, feel free to contact me and i know we're going to jump into some uh some questions now i believe if vibab is there let's have a look yeah um so we have a lot of questions here um we can pick yeah so in the discuss panel we have a lot of questions uh if you if you can just grab any questions, like let me just pick a few. Yes, <laughs> thanks. first of all, thanks everyone for watching. There's a huge amount of questions and if I can't answer them now, just ping me on Skype and I'll do my best to answer privately. So let's go for it. Yeah, yeah. so one of the questions is what development stage of a game do you think is great to approach a publisher and what is the best way to approach? <sighs> great, great question. Um, so, it depends on where you stand in terms of what I was talking about in terms of CTR versus um, CPI, right? The general rule in hyper casual is that earlier you can test the better, right? I don't know the speed of your studio, but if you can, if you can build just a couple of levels, say two minutes of gameplay and get a basic build in the store in three days, I would go straight to CPI, right? Because then you're going to do CTR as part of that anyway, and you're going to get a relatively accurate CPI to validate if you move forward. Maybe if you're at the earliest stage of your studio, um, then that's where CTR can be very strong rather than putting, you know, five days, 10 days into building a prototype where you really don't know the chances of success. You can do a quick CTR to validate the potential marketability of your idea. It's not saying it's going to be a hit. It won't be a hit. But, you know, if you've got 4%, you know, if you've got 8% that you know, then this is an idea that is worth uh, investing in building a prototype. So again, each publisher will have a different perspective, um, whether they want CTR or uh, CPI. Oh, okay. Okay, so one of the questions is, uh, you mentioned about the bonus value. Um, so how, how is that decided by a publisher when they decide to go ahead with the publishing deal? So again, each, each publisher will have their own commercial model. Some won't have this model, some will, um, but it will have been uh, built to, again, unfortunately some things you're not gonna be able to see. So they're gonna have made some assumptions and profitability calculations on actually how much rev share. So my, my advice here is, these upfront payments, I understand it from a developer perspective. I absolutely do, right? It's about risk. And you can look at some of these payments and think, oh, it's amazing. I'm going to make $200,000 upfront. Just check all the, the clauses on that, right? But actually, if you go through the process and publish a game, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd be very happy with $200,000, half a million dollars. But it's really hard to figure out what the equivalent is when you look at rev share, because there's a lot of things you don't really know in that process. But you know, my general view is if you've got lots of exclusions on that, i.e. you're only getting paid, paid out on iOS and Android, let's say US, China, UK, you're missing out on a lot of money and that money is going to the publisher. So um, I can't advise you on what is right for you. I can just try and speak as openly as possible to help you understand some of the things that um, you need to understand to make the best decision for you. Um, so speak to the publishers and, and understand what these payments are and the, the terms linked to them. Great. Um, what are the, okay, uh, there's one interesting question. Couple of years back, hypercasual was different from what it is <laughs> now with a bit of meta and trying to uh, retain player mechanics. How do you see hypercasual as a genre a few years down the line? Well, I mean, hypercasual is really exciting now. As I said in my presentation, um, it, it, it used to be this just 
target you know as many people as possible it's like you know i always let um, liken hyper casual to netflix right there's a there's a game for everyone i think hyper casual is so established now that you can actually build games for specific audiences in hyper casual and make very profitable games now you could never do that because you'd have to have a really low cpi so for example if you look at some of our car games um the cpis on those um are you know if we took them to another publisher they they wouldn't publish them but because they are built specifically in mind for a certain audience, the LTV on those games are significantly higher, which actually makes that CPI perfectly acceptable. Um, so there's a great trend now around female based games that I'm seeing in the charts. Why? Because the eCPM in female based games are actually quite high because you've got a lot of the casual studios that really want to attract those gamers like to their match three games. And you've got a lot of brands that are interested in those. So really how I see it evolving is, I mean, it's, it's already going that way uh, in your question, right? You are starting to see a deeper meta to games. And there's this this phrase hybrid casual that people are talking about. And then you always hear Archero, right? Ar Archero is a one off. If it wasn't, then all the Archero clones would have been top hits. And I think there's two ways to look at hybrid casual, right? You've got two schools of thought. You've got your um, your kind of more RPG theme. So coming down from RPG, so sort of like wizards and elves and uh, like kind of war kind of scenes um, and, and that sort of theme. And I think that's one school of thought. Uh, our, our belief is that actually the, the future of hybrid casual is going to look more like hyper casual. So you bring up the hyper casual theme, the same addictive core loop that you get in hyper casual. Um, but it does definitely have a much deeper uh, like story, uh, meta, game economy to it. And of course, th there are no metrics for it yet, but there's no doubt it's going to have uh, a lot higher percentage IEP versus usually in hyper casual, you might get 1% if that. Um, but we think that is the bigger opportunity in hybrid, hybrid, in hybrid casual to bring the hyper casual audience up with you um, rather than trying to make them this sort of leap up to not a mid core game, but mid core themes, right? You don't start playing hyper casual games and the next day you're like, oh, oh amazing, right? I'm going to start playing this like, you know, first person shooter or a, a mid core game or a triple A game. Um, so that that's how we see it evolving. That's very insightful. Um, Rohit uh, Hidu also wants to understand one, um, so it, it's it's like a situation, let's say a revenue share clause, say straight 50-50 share and no other conditions attached. Does it sound too good to be true as there was like no discussion? No, I mean, look, um, despite some of the warnings in my in, in my presentation, right, there's a lot of amazing publishers out there that want to see uh, your studio grow. So there are you know, for example, a, a, a Boombit, we have 50-50 rev share worldwide, iOS, Android, no exclusions. And I know other publishers do as well. So there, there is no catch with that. Um, I, I, I would encourage you more to look at the two big, too good to be true bonus clauses, right, where you see some very big numbers. That's where you should start digging for the exclusion clauses, because I suspect you're going to find that. Whereas usually on 50 50 rev share deals, um, to my knowledge, um, yeah, of course, you need to check with the publisher you're talking to. Um, usually they are worldwide iOS and Android. Awesome. Uh, why do publishers? So Yogesh uh, is asking, why do publishers have a lock in period, sometimes three months? even though they have tested and decided not to publish it? <laughs> I mean, again, I've given you my personal perspective on this. I uh, uh, Maybe it's fear, like just the, the, the super competitive nature of hyper casual. They just don't want anyone else to um, get hold of the concept. The irony is a simple reality. As soon as your game is in the charts, particularly on iOS, you know, every publisher, the top studios have got tools. The minute you publish a game, they can see it and they can probably marketability test that within a day. Right. So that's why also to me, that clause doesn't make sense. So a boom bit, um, it's really simple. It doesn't matter whether you do a CTR test, CPI test. You're not under contract. You're under contract. If we reject a game, you can do what you want with it, because so you should. Like, I have no right to own that game. And if me and my team believe we can't make that a success, you're more than welcome to uh, attempt that uh, yourself. That's very true. Um, so I 
Uh, mostly all of the questions. Uh, okay, one interesting one is: Do you think India India market could be huge if regional hyper casual games are made? That is a great question. I was having this chat yesterday, right? So there's a couple of these things. Obviously, what people forget about India is the size, the population, right? Um, in hyper casual, people obsess about the US market because it usually accounts for fifty to sixty percent of your hyper casual game revenue. But the population of India is like four or five x the US, right? But it's not just about how many players there are in the market for hyper casual when you're dealing with such fine margins between a CPI cost and your LTV, the thing that, that what we're seeing at the moment in India is we're not seeing as strong eCPMs, right? That's the, that's the, the, the dynamic that needs to change. There's a great presentation at Pocket Gamer last week um, for a publisher there where um, they were having the same conversation about MENA where, you know, Saudi has got insane eCPMs. So for me, India is a really exciting market. And I know there's a lot of studios that have built hyper casual games, you know, like cricket games just for India. Um, and again, I think if you're self-publishing, I think you can make profitable games out of those. But in terms of the global context, the thing that needs to uh, really change for the India market is we would love to see much higher uh, eCPMs that mean you know all of a sudden like revenue from India and in, on a global basis in your game is is jumping up. So that that's the key lever that needs to change. All right, man. All right. So um, I think most of the questions you have already answered in your presentation uh, as well. So. Uh, Guys, if you have any more questions, uh, you can reach out to John uh, separately on LinkedIn. He's on LinkedIn. He's on Twitter. Um, also, in the chat, I see uh, the BD manager of Boombit. Uh, so she has already posted her <laughs> uh, email. Juwan's in there. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. I've definitely got one, so, one, one person <laughs> that's watching me, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, on behalf of IGDC, to, uh, mm. for taking out time and sharing your knowledge with the people. It it thank you. Great. It's, it's an absolute honor to be here, and I'm I'm super excited for uh, the the Indian market. And thanks for listening, and thanks for your questions. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for for watching. Yeah. Bye bye.